Let's talk about substitution reactions. In general, a substitution reaction is replacing one functional group on a molecule with a nucleophile. Remember that a nucleophile is going to be a Lewis base that has a high electron density. Sometimes these are going to be fully anionic compounds, and then sometimes they just have a partially negative component. And typically, nucleophiles, as we've learned, are attracted to something called an electrophile, which is either going to be a fully positive carbocation or a partially positive uh, carbon with which is going to be attracted to a nucleophile. So there are two different mechanisms for substitution reactions. The first is going to be called an SN1 reaction, where the S stands for substitution, the N stands for nucleophilic, and the 1 indicates that it is unimolecular, or that essentially one thing is happening at a time. So what we can think about is, for example, a situation where you have an alkyl bromide. Remember that bromine, similar to iodine, is a very good leaving group, where and is acting as the leaving group. So a leaving group, at some point in time, if it is stable enough, can actually just pop off of this alkyl group. And in doing so, this is going to form a relatively stable carbocation. And this can especially occur with tertiary carbons, which have three other carbon groups attached to that carbon. This is going to be a stabilizing feature that stabilizes the carbocation, which we've talked about previously. Now that that bromide has left, what can happen is that you can have a nucleophile, like let's say it is uh, OR with a minus charge, can now come in either through the front or through the back, either side, and can replace that bromide, hence the name substitution. And this will generate a brand new compound where you now have a substitution. And again, this is called an SN1 reaction because each step takes place, one thing happens at a time. So the bromide has to leave first, and then subsequently you get nucleophilic attack at the recently formed carbocation. The SN1 mechanism is going to be the one that dominates when you have a tertiary carbon because you can generate a relatively stable carbocation only when you have a tertiary carbon. Another example of a substitution reaction is going to be an SN2 reaction. Again, the N stands for substitution, or the S stands for substitution, the N stands for nucleophilic, and the 2 now indicates that things are bimolecular, meaning that both parts of the molecule end up being semi-attached to the hydrocarbon at the same time. So let's think about an example of this. And one ex such example is going to be if you had this alkyl bromide, and notice that this is a primary carbon. So primary carbons cannot stabilize carbocations, which means that the leaving group can't just pop off because it would generate a very unstable species. So instead, what happens, let's assume that we have our same OR, is that it is going to come in on the other side where the bromide is not, because remember hydrogens are much smaller and these are where hydrogens are so it can fit in there more nicely. It is going to come in and when it attacks this carbon, what happens simultaneously is that the bromide gets kicked off. So notice that both steps are happening at once, which is why we call it an SN2 reaction. So that SN2 reaction generates, again, our newly substituted hydrocarbon and your bromide anion. So both of these pathways, you can substitute uh, different functional groups with nucleophiles. Notice that the important differentiation between the two is that for an SN1 reaction, you typically have to have uh, a, a very stabilized carbocation that's formed as an intermediate in this reaction mechanism, whereas for an SN2 reaction, they both happen simultaneously. Now notice that the carbocation that, that gets formed is a tertiary carbon, which means that this originally could have been a stereocenter, meaning that it has either R or S stereochemistry. But because an SN1 reaction is occurring, what essentially happens is that you generate a, an empty p orbital that is where your carbocation is. And when the nucleophile comes and attacks, it can attack either side of this p orbital. 
So as a result, SN1 reactions, you end up generating racemic mixtures because both happen where the nucleophile can come in on one side or it can just as likely come in via the other side. Notice, however, though, that SN2 reactions happen via what's called backside attack, where the nucleophile cannot come in from the same angle. So if you had or were generating a stereocenter, you would get inversion of the stereochemistry when doing an SN2 reaction. How can you tell if a reaction is likely to occur via an SN1 or an SN2 reaction? Well, remember that an SN1 reaction always produces a carbocation. So therefore, anytime you have a tertiary carbon where the leaving group is located, this is going to form a tertiary carbocation. So that is a tertiary carbocation. And because of the steric encumbrance, in addition to the stability of the carbocation, this is always going to proceed via an SN1 mechanism. On the other side, if you have a leaving group that is on a primary carbon, this is always going to form via an SN2 reaction. There's more room for the nucleophile to come in and attack the electrophile. In addition, if this were to try and proceed via an SN1 reaction, you would get a very unstable primary carbocation. So now the, the question then arises, which mechanism would follow if you had a secondary carbocation? And for this, we need to recall whether or not something is a strong or a weak nucleophile. Strong nucleophiles tend to have negative charges. So something like CN- minus or cyanide, something like an OH- minus or hydroxide, something like an, uh, a group like this that has a negative charge. These types of nucleophiles are going to be strong nucleophiles. Conversely, something like water is going to be a weak nucleophile. Weak nucleophiles are typically going to follow an SN1 reaction. So other examples of this are like ammonia, for example, where you don't have, even though it is a Lewis base that has lone pairs that can attack as a nucleophile, however, the fact that they are not charged typically is going to make them a weak nucleophile. And weak nucleophiles are not just going to ram themselves into the electrophile, if you think about it that way. So therefore, strong nucleophiles will generate SN2 reactions, whereas weak nucleophiles will proceed via SN1 reactions. So let's consider a couple of examples. Let's say that we do have this, pri this, secondary, uh, this secondary carbon, where there are two different R groups attached to the carbon. This means that it could either follow a SN1 reaction or an SN2 reaction. So it could be SN1 or it could be SN2. Then we need to identify whether or not the nucleophile involved is strong or weak. So if something, again, was OH minus, that's likely to follow an SN2 reaction. Whereas if the leaving group attached to the secondary carbon is attacked by a weak nucleophile, like water, that is going to proceed via an SN1 reaction. For this reaction, I know that it is an SN1 reaction because I have a tertiary carbon that is going to very easily stabilize a carbocation. Additionally, the steric hindrance at that carbon center is going to prevent an SN2 reaction, which is a concerted pathway from occurring. Therefore, I know that the very first step in an SN1 reaction has to be the leaving group leaving. And in fact, this is what happens, and it generates carbocation that is stabilized because it's tertiary. Importantly, because this is a process that happens very slowly, the rate determining step for this reaction is actually the leaving group leaving. Therefore, if we were to write the rate for this, it would be equal to K times the concentration of our starting material. And it would not be dependent on anything having to do with the nucleophile. That part is going to be very fast because once you've generated a carbocation, that is a very reactive species that's going to happen very fast. 
If you recall from previous chemistry courses, you would have learned that the slowest step is always the rate determining step. And this is actually why we call it an SN1 reaction, because only one of the species are responsible for the rate. All right, so now that we have generated our carbocation after our chloride ion has left, what happens is the nucleophile, the alcohol containing lone pairs, can come in at either the top or the bottom because of that empty p orbital that's generated to form the product. So this generates a product that is beginning to look like our final steps. However, notice that now that we have attached this alcohol, we have generated a positively charged ion. And in fact, what has to happen is this chloride is actually going to come and abstract this proton, and the electrons are going to go back to the oxygen. And this finally gives us our final product, which looks like this where we have now generated a new stereocenter, although importantly, because the nucleophilic attack can happen either from the top or the bottom of the molecule, this is going to be a racemic mixture, or a 50-50 mixture, if we were to generate a stereocenter. 